across the internet, hopefully. We are sending data over to Twitch, over to YouTube, to Twitter and Periscope, and to Facebook as well. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. If you are there, we are live right now with our aviary cam. My name is Patrick. I work at the aquarium here in social media. And joining me from her house a few miles away across the Monterey Bay, we've got Emily. Emily, how are you doing today? I am unbelievable, Patrick. I am Un so excited. Did Unbird-leavable. Oh my goodness. We're just winging it here for this afternoon's live <laughs> broadcast already, everybody. Hey, good afternoon. We are so excited here because uh, we are looking at our aviary cam, which uh, when the aquarium is open, this is staff and volunteers favorite exhibit to be in. And right now we've also got Curtis on the cam who's going to help us do a little bit of bird watching right now. And it looks like we've got some folks that are tuning in over on Twitch. Looks like we've got uh, Celestina there. We've got uh, Sarah over there. Folks are tuning in on Periscope as well and on Facebook. Thanks so much for uh, tuning in. Uh, so Emily, we are going to do a little bit of bird watching, which is something that folks can do uh, from home if you have a window uh, during this uh, season where uh, many of us are sheltered in place uh, quarantined uh, because of coronavirus, whatever your situation happens to be, bird watching is something that you can uh, potentially do from where you currently are. Isn't that right, Emily? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have a backyard, that's a great spot to go and hang out in and socially distance yourself from everybody else, but still enjoy nature, enjoy all the birds that come and visit. Even if you live in an urban area, you can still go urban bird watching from your yard or your window and, and take a look outside um, for those of you who have access to parks or, or you know wild spaces during this time too you can go bird watching you can go bird watching from your car you can go bird watching anywhere patrick so it's it's a wonderful activity that we can all do and Right now, we get to go to bird watching from the, the aviary cam right here. So That's right. We're going to give it a shot. And uh, I'm going to try something here real quick, everybody. We've got the technology. Uh, I'm just going to say hello to everyone here. Oh, look, it's there on the screen. Hi, everybody. Um, so <laughs> figured out a little way to hopefully uh, say hello to folks and to point out the different birds as we go here in the aviary because it can be a little bit difficult to see what it is that we are pointing out. Yeah, look at that. Uh, so high tech there. I'm getting, we're getting love already over there uh, from across the, <laughs> excuse me, from across the internet. Uh, yeah, this is extremely high tech right now. Hello, this is so great. Okay, so with, with that, Emily, let us get started. Uh, Curtis has zoomed in here on a couple of birds. And uh, let's yeah. see if I know how to draw here. We can start with this bird right here that I have uh, not completely circled. Let's see. I'll do a little arrow. This bird right here. Let's talk <laughs> about that bird there. Emily, can you tell us about the bird standing in the water at the moment? Yes. First, I want to tell you its name. And then we're going to go into a little bit of those tips and tricks that you can use when you're bird watching yourself. Um, so this bird is a marbled godwit. Um, the way that we can tell what type of bird this is, one, when you're just looking at birds, the first thing that you want to look for is just how big is that bird? This is a pretty big bird, especially for a shore bird in our aviary. So that already narrows down what kind of bird we are looking at to about three different kinds of birds. So. Big and bird. it has Perfect. just walked yeah. off screen. And so uh, Curtis is going to try to follow the marbled got around. Off it goes. But this is On her journey. Yeah. Yeah, there she goes. <laughs> Second thing that you're going to want to look for is what color is that bird? And this one you can see is brown with the, those kind of black speckles. Hence the marbled part of its name. It looks like it has marbling all over its back. Uh, so this is a marbled godwit there. And then you can also look at the color that it has on its beak. Of course, I'm saying this as it is facing away from us right now, but if you can see it as it's turning its head a little bit towards us, it has that really pale orange beak with just the black at the tip. Uh, that's how we can tell exactly what kind of bird this is. It has that really straight, narrow, long beak, no kind of curve to it at all or anything. It's just that uniform kind of 
curvature where it's not going anywhere uh, the whole way down its beak. So we can tell that this is a marbled godwit. Now, Patrick, yes, if it was brown and black and speckled and it had a really long down curved beak, uh, yes. We would be talking about a different kind of bird, a long-billed curlew, where we often see them together out there in the wild. I think I sent you a picture of what that looks like when they're out there on mudflats and beaches. Yes, um, you did. Marbled godwits together. Yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, if we stay here on this view here, then uh, I won't be blocking the <laughs> godwit too much. But here we go, everybody. There is that photo there of that one curlew that you should be able to see they're very very prominent it's best impression yeah of a of a marbled godwit there but you can see it's about the same size and shape and color as those marbled godwits but its beak is what's telling the story there of how to tell the difference between that bird and those marbled godwits so um, let's so see those are just some of the things that you can look for when you're trying to identify birds yourself out there in the field or when you're watching the cam is kind of look for the size of the bird, the color of the bird, what it's doing, and look at its beak. So I don't want to show off too much, but I think I've just circled there the curlew uh, there in, in my beautiful... Uh, you get an A+, Patrick. There it is. I mean, look at it go. So there's that curlew, and then the rest of those birds there are going to be those... Um, Marbled gotwits there. Okay, so transitioning away from uh, that beautiful bird. Uh, just very quickly, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, oh, not gauntlet, godwit. G-O-D-W-I-T there, Tamara on YouTube, who is wondering. Um, Emily, uh, I, I, I forgot to mention, certainly. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where these birds came from? We got a few questions uh, wondering, do these yeah. birds fly? What is going on? And uh, this aviary is a sanctuary for many of these birds, right? Definitely. This is a sanctuary for a lot of these birds. So there are 13 different species or 13 different types of birds birds that live in the aviary altogether there are about 18 individual birds i say about there's exactly 18 individual birds that live in here you don't have like 17 and, and three quarters um so 18 individual birds that live in here many of them are rescues uh rescues from the wild that were uh deemed non-releasable again they might be injured in some ways um, but many of the birds can still fly and will still fly through the aviary too. Uh, so we can keep an eye out for that this afternoon. But uh, some of them do have in injuries that would prevent them from being successful on their own out there in the wild. So instead, they live here in our little sanctuary of our aviary now. Some yeah. of the birds are also a part of breeding programs in accredited zoos and aquariums. Uh, so we also have some birds that are part of those breeding programs in there as well. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that quick intro. And I, I can see that um, Curtis was following some of the larger birds there with the reddish yeah. head there. And we had someone say the avocets are beautiful. Let me see if I can circle one of the avocets. There it is right there. And then we've They're got... They're moving a lot. So. Yeah, and we've got... I'm just going to do a general zone. Right in here is where the avocets are right now. And I'll pull up that photo. Can you tell us a little bit about those avocets? And there is that American avocet there with the red head that you should be able yes. to see. Oh, right. Nope. A little bit more over here now. There it is. Okay. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about... Uh, the avocets there. Yeah, so we have two American avocets, and you're going to see both of them right now on the cam that live here in the aviary. Um, one of the ways that you can tell that this is an American avocet, one, again, it's a big bird. Uh, two, it has those really strong, defined black and white spots on its back. And three, it has that kind of orangey, rufous-colored head right now. Um, I say right now because they are... In their breeding plumage, kind of going into their breeding plumage with that kind of orangish red uh, feathers, those feathers on their head there. But that's not what they look like all year round. Uh, sometimes if you're watching the cam or if you're out there along uh, wetlands, you might see them with more of a pale gray head. 
yeah. that's just their non breeding plumage. Yeah, I put that up there, uh, Emily, that photo that you got ready. Um, it's up on screen right now there with that gray head, that, <coughs> excuse me, that non breeding plumage there. So we've got that Avocet standing in the water right there with the beautiful rusty red head there, but they don't always look like that. And that is something about these aviary birds, everybody, where these birds change appearance all the time uh, throughout mm -hmm. the year. So um, they have their breeding plumage and their non-breeding plumage. And so it can really throw you for a spin if you feel like you've got your bird ID down and then you come right after they got their new yeah. plumage and then they just look completely different. So, um, so yeah, if depending on the season, you are more... Uh, you are more likely to be completely thrown for a loop as to what bird you're looking at, even though it could be one that you've seen many, many times. Exactly. And, and Patrick, I don't know if you could throw both of those pictures up on screen right now. Oh, I know I'm, certainly. I'm asking Here. you to go. Oh, no, no, no. You're a good. Just wild. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, well, we've already gone, I think, just way over the top in terms of production. There's drawing on screen. There's uh, picture in picture. Uh, we've got camera moves happening. So, I mean, this is just, this is the highest quality a coordinated stream. Coordinated effort right now from oh, three different places, actually four different places. Okay, I'm trying, trying not, to put this stream together. I'm trying not to block too much of the view, but I'm going to do it. Here's both of them there. There's uh, the male there with the red head and then a female with a gray head there on the lower part. Exactly. So um, that's... One thing that I wanted to show with both of them up on the screen right now. So you can actually tell that the difference between the males and the females by looking at their beaks. Uh, it's not so much anything to do with their coloration at all, but you can see that male has a really long and just slightly upturned beak versus the one that has the gray head there, the female, who has a bit of a shorter beak, but it has a really, really curved uh, like up curve to, to her beak there. So all females are going to have a shorter and more up curved upturned beak uh, versus the males, which their beaks are a little bit longer and not quite as steep in the upturn. All right, you can take the uh, photos. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Photos are off right now. And uh, hello to everyone who is there on the chat. Did just want to say hi to the folks that are tuning in on youtube on periscope on facebook on twitch thank you so much for being there everybody this is awesome uh, we've got a few folks that are recognizing some birds from their local areas there emily in particular uh when we see it we'll point it out but the kill deer is uh, a yeah. bird that is very recognizable Ooh, and we have Curtis now zooming in on one of my favorite birds here in the aviary, which is the ruddy turnstone. I'm going to get those images ready to oh, go. He's so handsome. Look at him. Emily, what is up with the name turnstone? What are they, well, what's that all about? That's a great question. So as Curtis zooms in here, you can see that it has that really tiny beak, but notice how kind of thick that beak is, especially at the base and that big powerful neck of it that is built so that these turnstones can go around flipping over stones, flipping over rocks, flipping over shelves, flipping things over and looking for things that are hidden underneath. So it gets that name turnstone because it's using that short but stout beak to flip things over, to turn them over and get to grubs and worms and you name it, hiding underneath. I know out there um, we often see black turnstones uh, in the Monterey Bay, uh, they're a pretty common sight uh, throughout part of the year, especially over by our great tide pool. You'll see them popping by, uh, but they have those little beaks and they're flipping over shells. They're turning things over, trying to get to little invertebrates hidden underneath. And uh, it, yeah, we've got um, we've got a few folks here that are recognizing these birds. Uh, there's also another type of turnstone, the black turnstone that folks may see along the shore. I see someone uh, mentioning that there are turnstones that you'll see along the, the, um, the shore a lot at the aquarium. I mostly see black turnstones there, um, but they have beautiful yeah. white and black striping on their wings when they take off. You can, they're, really, uh, they're really noticeable. Uh, and they're there really well. noisy. Too, they those are, turnstones. Yes. And they're usually in, in flocks of more than, more than one turnstone. Uh, but this is a ruddy turnstone, you can tell. It, 
apart from other turnstones because of that coloration. Looks like a calico cat on its back. I always think with those beautiful spots. Yeah, and um, no big deal, Emily, but I also managed to throw some text up on screen there at the same time. We're getting better at this every minute We're, here on the stream. I was uh, I was incredibly impressed, Patrick. Oh, thank you. I, I just no, wanted I'm to just, let you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I... I uh, Emily is our is our bird nerd uh, par excellence on the social media team. So I just am. trying to keep up with your expertise there. Um, I'm very excited to be bird nerding this afternoon and, and getting paid to watch the aviary cam instead of just having it on at my desk. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, now over here. Oh, no, the camera moved. Uh, over here. Close enough. <laughs> Uh, right there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Nailed it. Uh, that is another bird that you folks are, are probably familiar with if you've walked along the shore here. Uh, they are very noisy as well. Their trill is very distinctive and they have a beautiful red beak. There we go. Zooming in there. Tell us a little bit about that bird that we have in full view there, Emily. Yeah, this is a black oyster catcher. Uh, another one of those big birds. Uh, so we've gotten all three of the big Big birds. If we can check those off of our aviary bird list right now. We had the marbled godwit, we had the American avocets, and number three on our big bird list is our black oyster catcher. Um, it has that beautiful, beautiful bright orange red beak, those really pale legs. And uh, one of my favorite things about it are its eyes. It has these bright yellow eyes with this bright red ring that goes around it. And that's actually how it, ha it got its genus name of Hemoptopus, which means blood eye. Uh, so blood eye, blood eye bird right there. But um, for those of you around the world, you might also have other species of oyster catchers. They all have kind of that same big body plan, those same really bright beaks, uh, but different colors. So we also get American oyster catchers here in North America. Um, but this is our black oyster catcher right here. And she is actually one of the oldest birds at the aquarium, Patrick. That's right. Yeah, I don't. I lost track of how old exactly uh, she is. Um, is she in her second decade already, Emily? You know what? I uh, I think that she's getting close. I want to say okay. that she's about eighteen years old. Okay, she's getting close to her second decade. Yeah. So she is. Um, she's a Gen Z uh, oyster catcher. Um, <laughs> so you know, we're looking at her TikTok. But um, the, the thing that I wanted to point out about her as far as birds go um, is the beak, <clears throat> excuse me, the beak of the oyster catcher here at the aquarium. We actually have to trim that every so often because um, uh, as best as we, we try, we just simply can't replicate the amount of barnacles and limpets and hard shelled foods that uh, an oyster catcher in the wild would be feeding on. So their beak grows very quickly and they're usually blunting it down chewing on limpets and other hard shelled organisms so they're not munching on oysters but uh they are munching on a lot of very um yeah. hard shelled animals in the inner tidal pecking and pecking and pecking and eating that so that is something part of the bird care at the aquarium is taking care of that beak yes i, I just saw a comment the oyster catcher sure is an eye catcher yes yes i agree um if you tuned in uh, a couple of months ago, I think at this point, we did uh, an owl limpet live stream. We did. Uh, it was a superb owl limpet live stream. This is an owl limpet's biggest predator, these black oyster catchers here. And Patrick, I might be able to, to play uh, an oyster catcher call here real quick. I'm going to try and uh -oh, we're my bringing my phone in, into the microphone. We're bringing so in... A, a, another tech whoa, 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 element hold here. On, hold on. We're bringing in... <laughs> A whole bunch of high tech here right now, everybody. Get ready. This should be the sound of an oyster catcher. Oh, my goodness. There it was. There it is. That's that's I her. Did <laughs> you did it, Emily. Awesome. I don't know if my earbuds will ever recover, but uh, no, I think I'm I so think we were sorry. good. No, I think we were good. <laughs> Uh, let us know, everyone, if you can still hear us. Turn down the volume. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, but next time, we, I'll know where to put the level there. Um, we're trying out a whole bunch of different things here. Thanks for watching, everyone. That was amazing. That is exactly what you hear here along the coast there, Emily. Thanks for putting that on. 
Yeah, and and that was a a pair of oyster catchers calling back and forth to each other because um, oftentimes you have these mated pairs that stay with each other year after year after year and they go back and they nest in the same exact place and they'll just constantly talk to each other. And so you'll hear them before you can even see them most of the time. If you're out there bird watching, you hear those really high pitched shrill. I like your impression too. Oyster catcher. Oh, thank you. I've I've practiced. And it looks, (laughs) it looks like she's got a little bit of uh, a little bit of down from maybe a little bit of preening a little bit earlier there on, on her beak (laughs) there as well. She's got a little bit of fuzz on the beak there. Uh, yeah, just from probably doing a little bit of, uh, of bird <laughs> maintenance a little bit earlier. Okay. All right. Well, I don't, I don't want to make too many, uh, requests, but, uh, maybe we'll zoom out here to a larger view and see who else we can see everybody. Um, and by the way, if you're just joining us, welcome everyone to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live all across the internet. Ooh, looks like. Uh, we've got a little bit of a, okay, nice. We had a little bit of a pausing stream there. Hopefully you folks can still hear us. There we go. Panning around. Nice. So there goes Curtis. He's moving the camera around. We're going to see what (laughs) kind of bird we can find. Uh, but we've kind of covered the big ones. Ooh, they're in the back there. Let's see if I can, with the droopy wing, Oh, no, a little bit up from uh, right here, Curtis. Oh, if we can go back this okay. way. Uh, <laughs> nope, off we go on a wild adventure, wild bird uh, identification adventure. Oh, we've got a little bird right there by the trough. Nope, now we're going back. See, we're on about 10 second delay here. Uh, <laughs> so the bird that's right here. Yes. Oh, perfect. Yes. Nice, we did it. Okay, facing away from us. Emily, there we go. That is yes. the bird that so many people have uh, pointed out to us that they know. Uh, we had someone from CSUMB that was mentioning that there is a group of these birds that hangs out uh, on campus. It is now time Absolutely. for a famous bird that you folks were mentioning a little bit earlier in the stream. Tell us about the kill deer. Yeah, so this is a killdeer, and don't worry, it has a very scary name with killdeer. Um, they do not actually kill deer at all. Uh, the name actually comes from its call. People think that it makes a little killdeer sound, um, so they named it a killdeer. Uh, but these are birds that are found across North America year-round, um, no matter which state you're in, Canada, up there, Mexico. Um, if you have any kind of wide open grassy space or any kind of wetland or a shoreline there's a very good chance that there are going to be killdeers nearby um, they have this really really adorable face um, believe it or not the cuteness factor is actually something that ornithologists people who study birds that they use to identify birds so if you see a bird and you're like oh my gosh that is a really cute bird that's something that bird watchers ornithologists do they look for the cuteness factor and you can see on that kill deer it has that really short really round head and those huge eyes off it goes bird it there looks it like one of the avocets <laughs> decided to to scare it away there uh yeah it looks like the avocet oh and i no it didn't it didn't run quite back yet but yeah so that that kill deer yeah. that we were just looking at a very cute burb scientifically speaking stripper agrees she's barking yes. here <laughs> sorry about that but yeah science agrees this is a really cute bird it belongs to the plover family so a lot of you out there i know are snowy plover fans and are semi-palmated plover fans you love those plovers because of that cuteness factor and this kill deer is part of that same family it has that really really tiny small short beak that black unibrow that goes across its head right there it is just one of the most adorable birds it's another one of those birds that oftentimes you'll hear it before you can see it um so as you're wandering around and and going on you know a hike just to get out in nature you know just to take a moment to yourself if you can um i know a lot of us are are stuck in our homes right right now but 
Uh, if you open your windows and if you hear this particular call that I'll play here in a second and we'll make sure that the level isn't too loud this time. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll but... lower the volume. Are you about to play it? Yeah, I'll play it right right now. All right. Adjusting the volume, everyone. We'll see. This is a kill deer sound. Oh, that's awesome. All right, so you hear that that really high pitched trill there. Um, oop, nope, ah, not that sound. That was just Trooper trying to knock the, the, my desk over. Yeah. Um, but those really high pitched trills are kill deer. Um, there's often more than one probably in your area. Um, and right now, uh, you know, it's something to just not just keep it eye out for but an ear out for too now that you know what to listen for yeah um yeah i i would like to point out just real real quick um for those of you who might be interested in bird watching while you're while you're at home right now um you know bird watching out your window and you aren't quite sure where to start you don't have a, a bird identification book or anything like that don't worry there's a lot of really amazing apps out there one of my favorite ones um no way in, in part sponsored by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is Emily's. Yeah, <laughs> Emily's this is Emily's bird right recommendation. Here. Emily's bird recommendation, the Merlin Bird ID app. Um, it was created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and they do an amazing job. It's a free app that you can put on your phone. It helps you identify birds. You can put in where you are. You can put in the color of the bird and the size of the bird that you're looking at. It makes it really, really easy to help you identify the birds that you're watching. Um, so it's a l great little bit of citizen science as well. You can track what birds you're seeing, which is great right now. A lot of migrations are happening. So it's a little bit of citizen science there. You can help track birds on their migration across the world on that uh, Merlin Bird ID app. I know that we're also big fans of iNaturalist. Yes. Uh, that's another great resource if you are taking pictures of any birds in your backyard or out through your window or, again, from the window of your car in park. <laughs> don't don't go you know taking pictures while you're driving and bird watching but if you see a cool bird take a picture of it and submit it to iNaturalist and someone can help you identify that bird absolutely All right. yeah that's no, my little psa it's no i right iNaturalist uh merlin bird app it, those are all awesome uh just very quickly if you folks are just tuning in welcome uh, my name is patrick and that is emily that you just heard from uh, we're, the social, we're the social media team here at the aquarium, and we are currently doing some bird watching in the aviary. Thanks to Curtis, our webcam wizard, who is flying around right now. Now, if you've been on the stream for a little bit, you should know who this bird is that you're looking at. And also, Ooh. you should be able to tell whether or not this is a male or a female. So, in the chat, everyone, what bird are we looking at right now bonus points if you can tell male <laughs> from female okay we talked about it a little bit earlier and we've got both of them there okay we're gonna take off male and female because we switched birds everyone but what kind of bird do we have here in front of us we just talked about it a little bit earlier it's got the red head at the moment they've got the gray head otherwise what type of bird oh looks like i got maureen odia spencer on facebook in a tie with here be dragons on periscope uh and mandy watson as well uh, oh, we got all the answers coming in right now, but it looks like, yeah, we had Here Be Dragons and Maureen Odea uh, on Periscope and then over on Facebook. Avocet, yes, we've got an American Avocet right there. And uh, Emily, can you tell us uh, male or female? Uh, oh, my gosh, both of them are. Oh, both they just came be on. females. Yeah, They're, yep. <laughs> we're looking at to make it easy. You can see it has that really short, really upturned beak. Um, so that's how we can tell that these are opposites. That beak also is perfectly built for the way that it eats. So um, one thing that our aviculture team does here inside of the aviary is that they try and 
recreate a really natural foraging experience for these birds, which means that they'll take handfuls of bugs and grubs and crickets and sprinkle them out across the sand. Um, and they'll have little things that these birds can, you know, forage for their food as they would out there in the wild. That beak of an avocet is built perfectly to kind of swoop it back and forth in the water, um, almost acting like a little filter for it uh, to kind of pick up any invertebrates. So unlike other birds that you might watch who are using their beaks to poke down into the sand, you won't see that happening with these avocets. You can see with the beak curved like that, it would be really difficult to eat that way. So instead they're using that swooping beak to swoop through the water and kind of filter little invertebrates and worms and things out of the, the water like that. Absolutely. All right. So this will be on a 10 second delay, but Curtis, if you can hear us, let's go to a wide view <laughs> and then let's, let's flip 180 degrees around over to the other side of the dunes. So we'll wait to yeah. see if Curtis can hear us. <laughs> Uh, but right now you're getting just an awesome, awesome look at some American avocets. And uh, Emily, while we wait, there we go. We're zooming out. Where can we find a lot of these birds that you're seeing here? If you want to go see these in the wild, where could you go? Oh, and here we are flipping around. That's a great question. Off we go. So it depends on the bird. All of the birds that we're looking at right now are what we would classify as shore birds, uh, which means that they spend much of their time along the shore and that shoreline can be either saltwater or freshwater. Um, so I know like for myself, I'm from Arizona originally, uh, but I'm familiar with a lot of these birds because if you go to ponds and lakes and rivers, you'll see these same types of species out there, uh, out there foraging and living their lives. And so uh, these are all shore birds, but you don't necessarily have to be next to the ocean in order to see them. In fact, this area that we are looking at here, this exhibit that we have, the aviary exhibit, is built to recreate just a wetland. It's built to recreate Elkhorn Slough specifically, which is a wetland just north of the aquarium, about 20 miles north of us. Uh, but up there you have a mixture of saltwater and freshwater. So you have very specific areas and a lot of these birds are kind of built for those specific areas but they're all shore birds great question that's right okay so now we are looking at uh what would be little channels through um the through the mud flats of elkhorn slough like you were mentioning and uh, let's see if i can draw on screen but here in this general zone no, hold on, need to recalibrate. In this general zone, <laughs> nope, we're still moving. This white bird that's over here, yes, I nailed it. This little bird right here is one of my favorite types of birds. Uh, and what you're looking at also up here in this corner is another type of bird uh, that I just absolutely love. Those are phalaropes that you are looking at. I'm gonna put that up on screen, but uh, Emily, can you tell us about the two different types of phalarope, which are just amazing, amazing birds um, that fly so far around the world. There is our, looks like a red-necked phalarope. Uh, we also have the red phalarope. Uh, Emily, take it away. Tell us about phalaropes while I pull them up here on screen. I would love to. So that uh, phalarope that you circled that was in the very top left of the screen there was the red phalarope, the one that was a little bit down from it and further to the right uh, was the red-necked phalarope there. And you're able to tell them apart, even though they look really similar right now as they're in their non-breeding plumage, those gray and white feathers, um, because of their beaks. So again, they're about the same size type of bird. They're both gray and white right now, which makes it really difficult to tell them apart. But the third thing that I was looking for was its beak. And that red phalarope beak is going to be much different than the red-necked phalarope beak, which uh, the red phalarope has a kind of orange beak with a very black tip. And then those red-necked phalaropes have a much thinner, almost needle-like black, a solid black. So I could see that little spot of orange right at the base of the beak of that red phalarope that let me know 
hey, that is the red phalarope, not one of the red-necked phalaropes that we have inside the aviary right now. But it gets that name red phalarope because of those beautiful colors uh, that it gets during its breeding season where it's just that bright, almost like a rusty red color. And right now we're zoomed in onto those red-necked phalaropes, uh, which are going to be more of a white, gray kind of mottled back there, but a bright kind of rusty red neck instead of rusty red feathers all over its body. It just gets that little spot of rusty red feathers right on the back of its neck, hence the name Red Neck. Follow. Yeah, and um, I just figured out where uh, how to do all of that while you were talking there. So here is the image of the breeding plumage there of that red-necked phalarope with the name there up on the screen. Uh, so you know what you're looking at there. And uh, Emily, now I'm going to pull up here right next to it the red phalarope for comparison. So you can see a little bit of what you were talking about there. So I know I'm blocking the actual birds right now. But uh, <laughs> red-necked phalarope there is on the left and red phalarope there on the right. Um, that difference in terms of the needle-shaped beak and then the yellow color on the red phalarope, that's a really big difference there. But those are two phalaropes. Yeah. And my favorite part about phalaropes is their feeding style where they, yeah. s they spin little vortices in the water. They do little, just, uh, little spins over and over and over. And that creates a little vortex that pulls food up towards the surface. It's a really amazing uh, concept in the water where if you do that, if you spin your hand around very quickly, you'll suck up things uh, that are down deeper towards the surface. Jellyfish biologists use that fact all the time when they're trying to collect uh, a jelly in the wild to put it into a jar. They can spin their finger next to it and they can pull the jelly towards their jar without touching it. And also, if you're like our jelly aquarist, if you're trying to get some bigger jellies, you can spin your boat in circles and pull jellies up towards the surface to collect them for science. And that's what these little birds are doing. So if you ever see a little bird that is spinning around over and over and over uh, and uh, in one of these ponds, you're probably looking at a phalarope vortexing up little bits of plankton and other shrimp there to, to chew on. And right now we're looking at maybe a little red phalarope that's looking for a little bit of nap time there uh, <laughs> yeah. in the back. That's um, awesome. Another thing that's that's really cool about the the red phalaropes too is that when they are, um, so they're migratory birds you mentioned, Patrick. Um, and during the summertime, they'll head up to uh, latitudes much north of here, especially towards like Alaska, um, where a couple of other animals are heading right now. If you're fans of gray whales, they're yeah. on their migration currently. They are heading north up to Alaska to go mm -hmm. and feed on a lot of benthic invertebrates. So they really like to eat things that are hidden down in the mud. They're using their baleen as a filter to filter out things like amphipods from muddy sea floors but when they do that they create these big mud plumes and it brings up a lot of other little invertebrates with it um, and so red phalaropes will actually follow gray whales around sit at the surface and when these mud plumes reach the surface they'll do their little vortex create their own little whirlpool and chow down on all the little invertebrates that have oh. been brought up all those crustaceans brought up in the mud plumes by the gray whales. That's awesome. And um, it reminds me of something that another bird that comes and visits our area that we do not have in the aviary, but if you know Makana and Alika, everyone, those are two Laysan albatrosses that we have here at the aquarium. One of their close cousins, the black-footed albatross, visits the Monterey Bay every year, and they follow orcas around looking to munch on bits of blubber and leftovers from orcas when they're hunting in the area. So not uncommon for birds to be associated with whales, uh, kind of a whale posse or a, or an air force following them around and uh, looking to scrounge up bits of food from those mega animals out there. That was really cool, Emily. I didn't know that about the red phalaropes. That's super cool. Yeah, they're really cool. Do you want a fun fact about red neck phalaropes? You know what? Fun facts all over the yeah, place. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll allow it. Go for it. I think okay. the folks on the chat also <laughs> also want some some fun facts, but it's only only because chat is asking. Otherwise, no, no fun okay. facts. Okay, yeah, definitely not a, a, a personal ask there. Yeah. But uh, for the chat, Patrick, yes. um, for the red-necked phalaropes, you know, oftentimes when we think of birds, 
in the bird world, most of the time when you see a beautiful, brightly colorful bird, it's usually the male of the species. Uh, but in the fowler rope world, it's reversed. So females are often going to be larger and more brightly colored. And so for red-necked fowler ropes, the females are the ones who are doing the courting. So they're showing off to all the male birds instead. And uh, the male birds, they, they kind of have a role reversal in in uh, the, the, the bird world here wow. where the females, they lay the eggs, but the males are the ones who are incubating the eggs and raising the chicks. So... Um, it's kind of a, a, a bit of a, a, a switch, a, a divergence from the bird world there to have that role reversal in those redneck fowler ropes. Absolutely. Wow, that is very interesting. Um, I just want to point out uh, Curtis, so he'll, he'll hear us on a 10-second delay. There was a <laughs> little bird that ran away to the right side here of the reed. So we've got the, the ruddy turnstone there in the middle. But over on the lower right, there was another shore bird a little bit further over to the right. Uh, now we're getting into the, um, now we're getting into uh, bird ID 101 here. We're no longer in just the, the, <laughs> er, the, you know, starter, uh, early bird. the early birds. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Now <laughs> we're trying to worm our way into some more complex oh, bird true. ID because now we are heading towards uh, birds that look extremely similar to each other. Yeah, so they're in the background hiding away. Ooh. Oh, 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 yep. Okay, so these little birds right here, Emily, can you tell us who are we looking at? Uh, and maybe, first of all, what type of bird is that um, in general? And then let's let's see who we've got hiding out there in the back. This is we're, a real bird watching actually- now. Yeah, this is this is actually what it, it mostly is when you when you go bird watching in the wild. Uh, this is this is the real life where there's always reeds in the way and everything's a little bit out of focus uh, through your binoculars or through your camera lens. So uh, the birds that we were looking at there, though, we would have called peeps. Uh, they all belong to the sandpiper family, and uh, it looked like we had. Oh my gosh. I they keep on going away. Curtis is doing a great job. Curtis is doing to a great job birds. following them. Yep. But yeah, there, um, there but it is like one. Had... There is one bird right there that we were looking at a little bit earlier. Yeah, it looked like we actually had uh, two different species there. And uh, forgive me because I didn't get a good look at one of them to be able to tell exactly which kind of sandpiper it was. But the other one was probably a um, a sanderling. Um, and the way that I could tell that they were different birds was one was much more brown than the other the other one was much more gray and white versus kind of grayish brown and white which is a very um it's a very tricky distinction unless they're you know standing right next to each other there uh but oh, oh zooming in again yeah, here so, so they're right. in the, yeah they're in the middle those ones are definitely sandpipers Yes. So we've got one over here. We've got one of the sandpipers. And I want to say just from my non-expert uh, opinion, but that that is one of the semi-palmated sandpipers. Am I am I close? Or is that, you know, you that? Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm waiting to see its beak. Its beak to me is, is the indicator. And of course, it keeps on hiding its face. Which this is, uh, this so is a really the... good recreation of exactly what it's like to go bird watching everyone. So now we've, <laughs> now we've true. reached, now we've reached the true uh, level here. Yeah. So for the semi-palmated sandpipers, they're going to have more speckling around their necks. Their beaks are also going to be a little bit shorter than a Western sandpiper. And it's going to have just the slightest droop downwards to its beak. It's, it's very, very hard to, to spot unless, you know, you get a second to look at it for without it running away from you. Um, but yeah, those those uh, semi-palmated sandpipers have this. The slightest droop to its beak is a shorter beak. When you're looking at it, if its beak is about the same size as its head, um, as far as like length, goes it's a, sam- a semi-palmated sandpiper uh, the western sandpipers their beaks are going to be just slightly lo- longer than uh, the length of their head so you can see yeah on that photo there 
um, just that very slight droop to its beak, more speckling right there, almost like a little collar around its neck. And its oh, back man. isn't going to look quite as scaly, I this, think, is the word that I usually use for do, it. Emily, do you have any idea who's got the back to us here? I really can't <laughs> tell. I, so just I, so just guess, so you folks know watching that this uh, semi palmated sandpiper here on the left side is not necessarily this bird here. We're trying. I'm just pointing that out. Uh, but uh, Emily, can you tell who we're looking at? There? My guess is that is a western sandpiper. Okay, I'm gonna pull. At. I'm gonna pull that up right now so that we are accurate. So stand by, everyone. Western <laughs> sandpiper graphic is on the way. So. Unless it shows me its legs and it tells me differently. Western Sandpiper. We're typing. Things are happening, Emily. Okay. And now I just need to reorganize stuff so that I'm not completely blocking the bird. Give me one second, everyone. <laughs> Everybody's like, turn around, bird. Turn around. Turn around. <laughs> Let's <laughs> send us all of see your you. send all of your thoughts, your your psychic vibes over to. Okay, Susan just hopped into the chat. Susan is one of our aviculturists. It is a Western sandpiper. Oh, thank Yay. God. Okay, ten points, ten points to Ravenclaw right there. Okay, here we go. All right, there we go. We got the graphic, everyone. That's the Western sandpiper. Forget that. Oh, the semi palmated we... sandpiper. Sorry, semi palmated. She said semi palmated. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, okay. there's it there's, is. Well, there's the incorrect graphic that oh, I finally got figured a... out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i will get rid of that we went on i will no this is this is real this is real uh bird watching right here okay now i will return to semi-palmated sandpiper that photo, in that photo you can see its beak though its beak is slightly longer than its head is is wide and it has less of that spotting right around its neck that kind of collar that we were looking at on the the semi-palmated sandpiper so um <laughs> semi yeah, again this is this is the real bird watching of monterey bay aquarium if right you here. wanted the true experience now you know everyone exactly what it's like okay and we are back that is a semi-palmated sandpiper we have text on screen we are following Ooh. it in fact it. i'm going to put our social media tag back up there you are listening everyone to uh Myself, I'm Patrick, and then Emily, who has been our Hello. incredible bird resource here on this live stream. We are live right now at the Monterey Bay Aquarium's aviary. Um, and Curtis, our webcam wizard, is flying us around the aviary right now. You're looking at a bunch of rescued shorebirds and local uh, birds that you find here in the area. Some of them also hatched out in zoos and aquariums. Uh, and so... Right now, we're looking at the cutout of the channels, the saltwater brackish channels that might be in a slough environment, estuary environment. And I'm going to take the graphic off now. It looks like... I would like to say, though, just very quickly, yes. Patrick, that when when I go bird watching. I wish that I had Curtis there piloting a camera to zoom in on all the birds as they wander around instead of me trying to look through my binoculars, look down, look at my guide, look back up, try and find the same bird. And yep. this is this is a, a very relaxing bird watching experience to be able to ask Curtis to, to zoom in on those birds for us. It's incredibly high tech right now, uh, what we're able to do. So thank you, Curtis. Now, uh, Curtis will hear us on about a 10 second delay here. But uh, Curtis, I think if we go to a wide angle shot on the dunes, uh, but sort of the left side of the dunes, we should be able to find the rest of the birds that we're looking for uh, on this stream. So uh, we had the sandpiper discussion. Um, about uh, the Western Sandpiper, the semi-palmated, so you know that those are out there potentially to look. But now we're gonna look for a few more. Here we go, Curtis is moving us around. So let's see who we can find. Uh, Emily, do you know who this bird is? Looks like we are flying towards it. Oh, just moved. Who this bird is right down there. I sure do. That's a Dunlin. Dunlins are one of my favorite birds. So yeah, I I know this friend. And 
And we um, have we have not discussed Dunlins yet. Is that correct? No, we haven't. All no. right, here we go. Bringing um, that up. So right now it is transitioning between its plumages. Um, so it's it's actually pretty easy to tell this bird apart from the other ones. Um, even though it looks remarkably similar to a lot of the peeps, especially those pipers that we were just looking at. Um, if it turns around and shows us its tummy, you'll be able to see the very beginnings of a Whoa. black patch. I just um, blocked it with the graphic. Oh, I'm sorry, everyone. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh, no. All right. Thank you, Curtis, on the assist. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing Nothing quite like looking at a real yeah. bird and then slapping a photo of it on top. But uh, yeah, there's that Dunlin right there. Awesome. Yeah. So during its, I love that photo of the Dunlin too, because it just looks so majestic with the little flowers behind it and everything. Uh, but the Dunlin, it gets that little black, almost like a little cummerbund, a little, uh, you know, spot around its uh, tummy there. Um, the way that I remember it is is because of the beak. It, it you know, again, very similar to the way the semi-palmated uh, sandpiper's beak is just very slightly droopy at the end. It goes down. If you look at the Dunlin's beak, it also just has that very slight droop. It goes down, which sounds like dun. So dun, down, downlin, dunlin. Um, so just one of those little mnemonic, you know, phrases that I use in my head to remember my birds by. But um, but yeah, I, I just love the the way that they look in their breeding plumage. They're those Dunlin's um, with just that that beautiful calico pattern on their back and that big black tummy spot there which is just so cute I, I know that i've been using the cuteness factor to describe the plovers but i i think that the dunlin also falls pretty high yeah. up there on the cuteness factor now i think right here we may have one of the last birds that we haven't talked about yet uh curtis is currently zoomed in on it oh sorry i just drew in the exact wrong location we're heading towards the center so it's right <laughs> there nicely done uh, tell us a little bit about that bird right there. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that that's a sanderling. Did I get it? Uh, yeah, it looks like a sanderling to me. It has yes. those really starkly black legs, that bright white tummy, and the feathers on its back that are more gray than brown. Um, if it shows its, its beak as well, you'll notice that it is really, really very, very almost jet black. There, oh, right on cue. Thank you, Sanderling. Um, yeah, so it has that really distinctive, just jet black beak and those jet black legs um, against that really bright white uh, tummy and face of theirs. So this is winter plumage for our little Sanderling. It is refusing to untuck its uh, its right leg there. It's just going to hop around with its leg tucked up into its semi. Actually, Patrick, uh, do you want to talk about that, about uh, why we often see our birds just standing on one leg in the exhibit? We haven't talked about that yet today. Yeah, no, and often people uh, walk in and they really can't see the other bird, the other leg of the bird, and they wonder, oh, is that, was it injured? Is that, is that what was going on? And um, with a lot of these birds, um, this is an open air, excuse me, this is an open air exhibit uh, and so it can get pretty cold uh, in there if there's a little bit of a, a wind, uh, a little bit of a draft going through. Um, and we have some heating uh, lamps inside the aviary as well. So you often see the birds under those if they're getting chilly. But when they're resting, they'll often just pull one of those legs up inside the down of their belly feathers to help keep that leg nice and warm. I don't know if you've ever, uh, you know, tucked a cold foot underneath uh, underneath your other leg to try to warm it up, um, or if you've, uh, you know, ever put a very uh, cold foot on somebody else uh, as a prank. You can get a little bit of chilly feet there on the shore, and so that's what these uh, birds are often doing: is they are. Um, they are warming up one of their legs there at, uh, at, and so it's doing it there actually right now live on the camera again, uh, tucking up one <laughs> leg in there to help warm up maybe some chilly toes. Yeah. Now, a lot of you are probably familiar with Sanderlings and you don't even know it. Um, if any of you are fans of the Pixar short called Piper, yes, Piper was a Sanderling. Um, and if you've ever been out on a beach before and you sat there and watched birds chasing the waves kind of going out, 
you know, chowing down, sticking their little beaks in the sand. And as the waves coming back in, running back up onto the beach there, those are usually flocks of sanderlings that you see out there chasing the waves along a beach. Um, especially in the winter time here in Monterey, we just get huge, huge flocks of these sanderlings all along our beaches. Um, especially if you go up towards um, seaside and, and Marina State beaches there, um, you'll often see the, the sanderlings chasing the waves back and forth and back and forth. But Piper in that particular short uh, was a sanderling. Sanderlings, um, as are Dunlins, they're all part, all part of that same sandpiper family. So um, they yes. weren't incorrect when they called her Piper in the movie, but people think that she uh, is a different kind of Piper when, in fact, she's she's a sanderling. She's one of these, cu- and again, cuteness factor, very high. Very honestly. high, as she is currently tucking her beak there into that down warming up as best as possible there absolutely adorable yes and um i i read somewhere i forget uh forget where emily but um that sanderlings are so common and can range so far and wide around the world that uh, i believe someone famously wrote that uh, there's no beach in the world that has not received sanderling footprints or something uh to that effect uh that has not been trod on by by sanderlings paraphrasing there so if anyone (laughs) happens to know that quote uh but that's just to show that sanderlings are found so many different places all all around they're they're another one of those really highly migratory birds too so they they'll breed up on the high arctic tundra um and then migrate south um in in the fall and and you know sometimes you'll see them like in you know, coastal New England, which is, is you know, a, a, a fairly, you know, close, I would say, as far as like the distance for the migra- migrations go for these birds. But some sanderlings will actually go from the high Arctic all the way down to South America. That's a 6,000 mile trip that they're making and then going all the way back. So it's 12,000 miles that they're flying every year from their foraging grounds to to their nesting grounds and and all over the place so yeah. really really important migratory birds and important for us to keep migratory spaces for them to be able to make those long migrations absolutely and it's also important to remind ourselves that if you're ever singing the i would walk 500 miles song that that's really not <laughs> that impressive once you start getting into the bird <laughs> world so um I but you make 12,000 I would fly 12,000 miles just to be the centerling that was running there on the shore. Um, (laughs) Nailed it. But so uh, that is a really great point that you bring up there, Emily, as far as uh, these birds. Uh, Many of them rely on those wetlands, those coastal areas that are heavily impacted by human activity, whether that's from uh, pollution that can happen from... um, from uh, different sources or if it's development and other things. So um, there's lots of work being done to help restore wetlands. And if you're wondering, okay, well, why does this area need to be reserved? Why can't we build this or what's going on there? Often it's these birds that are just using that beach, that area as a pit stop on a massive migration. And we need these shorebirds in all the different environments that we find them because they are so crucial for um not only feeding on so many different things, fertilizing things, moving nutrition around. Um, and they're just uh, from, you know, the sounds that you hear them, they're just an integral part of the soundscape and the ecosystem of our of our area. We definitely want those birds uh, around. And so uh, that's one thing you folks can help us do, have been doing for a long time, is helping us protect those wild spaces for exactly these kinds of birds as so that they have that pit stop when they are migrating maybe 12,000 miles around the world. Yeah, and you know, oftentimes you'll hear us talking about, you know, protecting our wetlands and our shorelines and things like that too. But if you're in the middle of the country, say next to a whole bunch of farmland, um, that's also a really important pit stop for a lot of migratory birds as well. And one of the reasons why oftentimes people advocate uh, for using less pesticides or safer pesticides for these birds because they're out there. Or they're using these big wide open fields too and feeding on all the, the bugs and things that are, you know, trying to eat your crops and stuff. So these birds are really important to farmers as well, helping them to, to maintain their plants and their crops. They're out there, you know, no matter where you are in the world, they're using these really important places on their flyways as they're going from north to south and south to north. Um, 
no matter where you are, whether it's near a wetland or out there in the Great Plains, you name it, there are birds out there. Or like I mentioned at the very beginning of the stream, even if you're in an urban area, uh, there are birds out there all the time. So just keeping an eye open and, and looking for those birds is a great activity to do, especially right now. It's a great activity to do with your kids too. If you're looking for activities right now to, you know, keep them occupied and, and help them learn. Um, you know, we have some great resources on our website, activities for kids to do uh, and for parents to do with their kids right now. Um, and one of them was talking about um, doing science together. This is a great example of that. You can use a tree in your backyard and keep an eye on that tree, keep track of the types of birds you're seeing in it, what kinds of activities they're doing day after day, check in for just 10 minutes. Sit there and watch your tree in the backyard and see who's coming to visit. See if that changes over time. See what they're doing while they're out there and see if that changes over time too. You know, these birds are out there all day, every day, and um, you can use them in this time right now as a fun activity to do with your kids. You can make bird feeders with your kids right now too uh, and, and help those birds that are on their migrations. That's our little way of helping out as well as to make sure that these birds do have food to fuel those long migrations across the world. Um, so there are lots of cool little activities that you can do right now with your kids to encourage them to make that connection with nature, even as we're, you know, a lot of us are, are stuck inside our homes right now. It's, it's a little bit of a, a connection, that touch point with nature that you can have. Absolutely. That was very, very well put, Emily. And then um, just very quick, if you have folks out there that think, oh, well, birds are boring or, oh, they're not as interesting as this or that, or, you know, it's not, it's not a marine mammal. It's not something. Uh, birds are dinosaurs here among us. So if, uh, if you're trying to pitch it to your kids um, and they're not all oh, bird watching, what's that? It's like, how about dinosaur uh, watching and um, yeah, try to figure it out <laughs> because that's exactly what what we're doing. What we're looking at here is these uh, these modern representatives of that lineage that has been around uh, for so long here on the planet. Birds are often overlooked. Uh, they're just the thing that's flying by, or but they're an incredibly important part of every single. Um, uh, habitat that we have here along the shore. You need your birds there. So um, excellently put there, Emily. That is a really great activity to do. Uh, it's a little bit of bird watching. Start identifying your neighbors and uh, you're going to have a much richer world to look at uh, wherever you happen to be if you say hello to your bird friends like we were able to do this afternoon. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Emily, I did want to point out We've been at this for about an hour here. Uh, an we've, hour, yeah. We, we've, we've, <laughs> tuckered, we've tuckered out the Sanderling. Uh, she's lying down right now completely, no and longer. And the killdeers, too. Killdeer is oh, looking out. And about this. <laughs> killdeer is looking for a little bit of a nap there amongst looking the Looking at reeds. us right now. Just, what, just like, are you going to leave me are alone? You, <laughs> are you wrapped up? Did, did you finish? Just an adorable yeah. killdeer. Uh, looking at us, wondering, okay, well, what's what's going on? Are do you have you exhausted everything that you have to say about birds? And I don't believe that we have exhausted anywhere close no, to what we have to say about <laughs> birds. But maybe we've exhausted our time here uh, together. Uh, yeah. We do want to make sure that you folks have time to go and uh, hop on other educational opportunities, or if it's three thirty uh, on Friday afternoon, like it is here with us, maybe it's uh, about time that you're wrapping up whatever it is that you're doing for the day. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us here in the aviary in the chat. Uh, first and foremost, can we get please a quick round of applause with bird emoji to Curtis for flying us around here in the aviary. So bird emoji of your choice there in the chat. I'll give everyone about 15 seconds for that uh, to show up. Emily, do you have a do you have a favorite bird emoji? What would you be spamming in the chat right now if you could? Oh my gosh, I don't don't make me choose, Patrick. I'm sorry. Top three bird emoji. <laughs> um, I like the I'm owl. A fan of the death. Okay. And the owl. Okay. Yeah, owl is definitely up. Well, I'm a big fan of owls as it is. Just just ask pretty much any volunteer guide at the aquarium if you got me talking about burrowing owls this conversation instead of being an hour long would be about a week long okay um so definitely owl oh look at that up there we've got too. so many bird emoji going in the chat right now emily this is oh there goes your duck <laughs> there goes the ducks that we got some this is a duck 
Oh, that's the awesome. Chickens. Yeah, I love it. Some cardinals are going by. That's awesome. Okay, that was for Curtis. Uh, can we give <laughs> um, Can we give a quick round of applause uh, over here to Emily for all of the work that she put together, getting Aww. those images together, all of the bird information. That would be That's excellent. And I'll I was going to say we should also share a lot of bird emojis for our just, again, I'm going to use the, the same pun, but our unbelievable aviculture department Absolutely. who are yep. working so hard to care for our animals right now and making sure that they have a healthy clean habitat day after day that they're getting food and enrichment and all the love and care that they that they need um they're doing just an amazing job right now so absolutely so lots and lots and lots of bird emojis to yes. our aviculture team yeah let's get all those bird emoji in there for susan who is in on the chat uh, as well, specifically, Susan, if you're still there, these next uh, this next batch of bird emoji is uh, all for you to spread around to your amazing team of aviculture uh, folks. Oh, look at that. We've got so many bird emoji. Um, I'm pretty sure that those are unlimited. But uh, if you folks are seeing uh, that there's a <laughs> limit, um, feel free to we'll 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 help you re up your your emoji there. Uh Awesome. Oh, this is great, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in all around the internet, wherever you happen to be, whether that was on Facebook, on Twitch, on YouTube, on Periscope, and Twitter, wherever you happen to be. Thank you so much for going bird watching with us in the aviary. We will definitely be doing this sometime again. Uh, Emily, any parting words for us? And then I'll, I'll turn off our, our microphones and we'll, we'll head out oh. into the world. <laughs> I, I think I've exhausted the, the topic today, but again, I just want to encourage you all um, that that bird watching, no matter where you are in the world, what kind of home you are in right now, whether you're on lockdown, whether you're in an apartment in the middle of a city, if you are out in the middle of open fields with lots and lots of space and you know on a ranch in the forest no matter where you are in the world in the desert too desert is a great place to go bird watching that you all have the ability to go bird watching right now and that these birds you know they're making these 12,000 mile trips across the world um it's something that it, it connects us all it ties us all together and um I think that that's a, a really cool concept that we can all be bird watching. That you might see a bird today that in a month, someone three thousand miles away from you might be, be seeing that same bird. So that's it's right. A, it's a cool moment to to connect us all right now. Yeah, we can use those birds as messengers between the continents for all of us as we shelter in our respective areas, and we hope to see you all again soon at the aquarium. And in the meantime, go look at a bird, send it to us. We'd love to see it. And thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. Thanks for being there. We hope to see you again soon here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are out there in the world. Thank you so much for spending some time looking at birds here with us. Thanks, everyone.